Welcome to our webinar series, Non-Invasive Prenatal Testing, Background, Science, and Clinical Implementation. This module discusses challenges of NIPT faced in the clinical setting, primarily when results of NIPT and clinical findings do not agree. After viewing this webinar, you should be able to discuss several biological explanations for discordant NIPT results, using specific cases for example. You should also feel comfortable with your knowledge regarding recommendations following discordant NIPT results. As NIPT is a screening test, false positives and false negatives can occur. Professional societies recommend that all patients with positive NIPT results be offered confirmatory diagnostic testing. A discordant NIPT result is one in which the results of the NIPT report do not match the karyotype or clinical outcome of the fetus tested. As our knowledge and clinical use of NIPT has expanded, so has our understanding of how the biological characteristics of cell-free DNA can lead to discordant results. Listed on this slide are examples of biological phenomena that can affect the cell-free DNA and thus the results of NIPT. We will delve into each one of these in more detail. First, a closer look at mosaicism. We discussed mosaicism first in Module 1 and understand that mosaicism occurs when all cells in an individual are not comprised of the same genetic material. The developing fetus and placenta are derived from the same cells, and in the majority of cases, the genetic composition of fetus and placenta will be identical. However, in some cases, there will be a change in the chromosomes in either the placenta or in the fetus, leading to a difference in their genetic information. Figure A on this slide represents a fetus and placenta that are both mosaic or a trisomy. Since the NIPT assay averages the amount of cell-free DNA present across the placenta, a negative or positive result could be obtained, and neither would be completely accurate. In example B, there is a possibility that the NIPT will detect an abnormality that is present in some of the placental cells, which is not reflective of the cells present in the fetus, a false positive, due to confined placental mosaicism, also called CPM. This risk is also present in chorionic villus sampling, or CVS. Studies have shown the risk of CPM in CVS is approximately 1%. In example C, NIPT will likely not detect the abnormality that is present in the fetus, a false negative, as the placental cells do not have the abnormality. This is confined fetal mosaicism. The same risk exists with CVS. All of the scenarios previously presented are important to know for following up on NIPT results and explains potential discordant results when they occur. Obviously, invasive testing is recommended to follow up on any positive NIPT result. Some clinicians have questioned whether CVS is appropriate for follow-up as it may carry the same risk for detecting mosaicism. This should be left to the clinician's discretion. If a fetus has a normal karyotype but a strong suspicion still exists for a CPM, follow-up ultrasound screening should be considered. Pregnancies complicated by CPM may be at a higher risk for growth issues and fetal demise. To illustrate how confined placental mosaicism can affect NIPT results, let's look at this case. A 35-year-old woman had NIPT with a pretest indication of advanced maternal age. Both NIPT and FISH via CVS were consistent with trisomy 13. However, the final karyotype showed 46XY. Diagnostic testing should be recommended following all positive NIPT results. Additionally, knowing that CPM can impact both NIPT and CVS analyses, awaiting final karyotype results before making irreversible decisions is imperative. This next case illustrates how fetal mosaicism can also affect NIPT results. A 31-year-old patient with an abnormal ultrasound had a normal NIPT result. How should this patient proceed? Practice guidelines indicate that any patient with an abnormal ultrasound finding should be offered invasive diagnostic testing. A cystic hygroma can be seen in genetic conditions other than aneuploidy, which are not screened for with NIPT. Diagnostic testing was performed following birth, and the infant was detected to have mosaic Down syndrome. Depending on the level of mosaicism present, 
NIPT may not detect mosaic aneuploidy. Next, let's discuss how co-twin demise, also known as vanishing twin, can affect NIPT results. A co-twin demise is also known as a vanishing twin and results when the pregnancy starts as a twin pregnancy, but one fetus dies in utero, leaving only one viable fetus. Approximately 3% of all pregnancies in the U.S. are multiple gestation. In one study cited here, 549 twin pregnancies were examined, and 27% had a spontaneous production prior to seven weeks. The implications of this can be observed using NIPT. We know that cell-free fetal DNA is cleared very quickly from a mother's bloodstream following delivery. However, we do not know how long cell-free DNA exists in circulation when non-viable products of conception are retained. It is hypothesized that the products of conception from the demise may undergo apoptosis more rapidly than the surviving singleton, and thus cell-free DNA from the demise might be more abundant than that of the surviving singleton. This could lead to both false negative and false positive results. Let me show you. Here is a case study of a patient who had blood drawn for NIPT at 13 weeks. Her clinical history was consistent with a co-twin demise noted around week 10 or 11. NIPT results were positive for trisomy 21 in a male fetus. The patient underwent amniocentesis and the karyotype analysis showed 46XY normal karyotype. When there is a history of co-twin demise reported, many clinicians want to know if there is a time frame between the demise and the drawing of blood for NIPT. Currently, there are not any consistent recommendations reported. Some clinicians choose to wait about four weeks following a demise before ordering NIPT, as is typically done for traditional serum screening methods. Here is another case with a co-twin demise. Blood was drawn for a female patient 13 weeks pregnant post-IVF treatment with three transferred embryos. Two embryos initially implanted, but an ultrasound in the first trimester showed only one viable embryo, with an estimated demise at seven weeks for the other implanted embryo. By week 11, there was no evidence of any products of conception for the demised embryo. The patient's NIPT results were consistent with trisomy 21. Amniocentesis was then performed and results were consistent with a male fetus with trisomy 21. I use this particular case to remind all of you that even in cases where there is a history of co-twin demise, one must still follow up appropriately. This is even more important when there is an extended amount of time from demise to blood draw. Let's now discuss maternal genetic aberrations and how they can affect NIPT. The CFDNA analyzed during NIPT includes an admixture of fetal and maternal DNA. As a matter of fact, the majority of cell-free DNA is of maternal origin. Thus, it makes sense that if there are any differences in the maternal karyotypes, these can affect the NIPT results. Let's look at a case. This patient is a 36-year-old female with a normal ultrasound at 18 weeks and a clinical indication of advanced maternal age. The patient's history was also significant for fertility problems, and the report of a previous pregnancy loss was products of conception showing both an X chromosome abnormality and an unspecified trisomy. NIPT and maternal blood karyotype were drawn at the same time. The NIPT results were positive for monosomy X, and the patient underwent an amniocentesis and follow-up, which showed a normal female karyotype, or 46XX. Interestingly, the patient's blood karyotype came back significant for a deletion on the long arm of chromosome X. Again, the NIPT was discordant with the fetus but had a biological basis as it was concordant with maternal karyotype. Here is a case that shows another situation in which the mother was the one with the sex chromosome abnormality. In this case, the maternal karyotype was mosaic with five cells counted having monosomy X or 45X and 15 cells with two copies of X or 46XX. Women born non-mosaic 46XX may be mosaic for 45X cell line by the time they are pregnant and presenting in your clinic. This slide illustrates the findings of an interesting prospective study. XCL means X chromosome loss. 19,650 cultured peripheral blood lymphocyte cells from 655 unselected females aged birth to 80 years 
referred to Wessex Regional Genetics Lab for Cytogenetic Studies, 1998 to March of 2001, were screened for this study. This study included loss in peripheral blood lymphocytes. CFDNA is generated from multiple cell types, including peripheral blood lymphocytes. In this study, the observed frequency of X chromosome loss ranged from 0.07% aged 16 years to 7.3% at greater than 65 years. The study demonstrated a highly significant quadratic relationship between X chromosome loss and aging, with a p-value of less than 0.0001. Since monosomy X does not occur more with increase in maternal age, one might be more suspicious of maternal mosaicism if cell-free DNA results is abnormal for monosomy X in an older mom. Wang et al. in 2014 also reported interesting findings that in a study of 187 abnormal NIPT reports for sex chromosome abnormalities, approximately 9% were reflective of the maternal karyotype and not the actual fetus. Reported karyotype results included monosomy X, triple X, and mosaic forms of each. When reporting out sex chromosome abnormalities, particularly those involving the X chromosome, consideration of maternal karyotype analysis is also recommended. Maternal medical conditions can also be the cause of discordant NIPT results. This next case is quite interesting and was the first published case of maternal malignancy detected following NIPT. A 37-year-old patient was referred for NIPT at 30 weeks for advanced maternal age. Initial results were positive for both monosomy 18 and trisomy 13. The test was performed on two separate aliquots from the same sample with identical results. A normal ultrasound was reported and the patient underwent amniocentesis. Karyotype and microarray results showed a normal male or 46XY chromosome. Because this case was baffling, a second blood sample was obtained to repeat the NIPT. The second blood sample still provided the same NIPT results of monosomy 18 and trisomy 13. A third blood sample was obtained and sent to another NIPT laboratory for confirmation. The laboratory reported the results as unreportable. However, the lab director provided verbal confirmation that the NIPT results were highly abnormal with trisomy 13 and trisomy 18 detected. The patient went to term and delivered a healthy baby boy. However, within days of delivery, she was diagnosed with metastatic cancer following a workup for complaints of persistent and worsening pelvic pain. The patient underwent a biopsy and tissue from the primary tumor was sent for fish testing. This result showed one to two fluorescent signals for chromosome 18 and two to three signals for chromosome 13, consistent with mosaic loss of chromosome 18 and mosaic gain of chromosome 13. As previously mentioned, this case was published in prenatal diagnosis. Several more cases that have identified maternal malignancy have now been published in the Journal of American Medical Association. These cases serve as an important reminder to be cognizant of the various sources of cell-free DNA and what can affect NIPT results. Though the majority of abnormal NIPT reports will not lead to a cancer diagnosis, there are certainly times when the results appear highly unusual and maternal medical history should be reviewed. Speaking of medical history, this case was also the first time our lab encountered organ donation. The patient was actually referred to NIPT because of a family history of Down syndrome. Medical history was obtained, which included basic information on kidney issues and renal transplant. NIPT was performed and results were consistent with a normal male, but ultrasound results were consistent with a female fetus. It was not until further probing that the patient shared that her most recent kidney transplant was from a male donor. Certainly, cell-free DNA from the kidney cells would contain a Y chromosome, which can skew the NIPT results. Complete medical history, including timing of any procedures, transplants, and transfusions, is important for consideration. Lastly, there are many other genetic aberrations in fetus or mom that can cause discordant NIPT results. Copy number variants, known as CNVs, and other chromosome anomalies in chromosomes other than 13, 18, 21, X, and Y can affect the sequence data. Since Illumina's method of whole genome massively parallel sequencing includes sequence data from other chromosomes for the denominator in the NCV calculation, imbalances can potentially affect results. These can be at the level of an entire chromosome or in a particular region, as with the CNV. 
The technology utilizes an NCB as a statistical cutoff value, which include false positive and false negative results. In summary, there are many counseling considerations to be taken into account when NIPP results appear discordant. Statistical test performance parameters are important to review. It is also important to review a complete pregnancy and medical history, looking for information about co twin demise and detailed maternal medical history. When invasive testing is recommended, it is also important to have a discussion about CVS versus amnio, extra counts to rule out mosaicism, and inclusion of microarray with standard karyotypes. Consideration of maternal chromosomes and serial ultrasounds in pregnancy are also important. This concludes this module of non-invasive prenatal testing, background, science, and clinical implementation. Thank you.